Isaiah chapter 50, please. Isaiah chapter 50. In this passage, the prophet Isaiah is speaking to the children of Israel, prophesying about its apostate state and its restoration, that the nation of Israel, in spite of their sins and their sins separating themselves from God, that they would be rejuvenated and that God would stir up their hearts to actually regain a strong conviction in the Lord. And no matter how many trials or how many attacks they face from the enemy, this conviction is so strong that they will hold on no matter what and they will overcome until their Messiah comes. So you can imagine how horrifying the tribulation will be under the Antichrist with that pressure of 666. If you think life is hard now, think about life during the tribulation. These Jews, they endure to the end for their salvation. They have the strength and the conviction to go through that kind of hell on earth and gain victory at the end until their Messiah, their King of Kings, comes down. Now, I would like a conviction like that. As we're nearing the time of the tribulation, and I could be wrong, but personally my belief is that I will be raptured together with you, that the tribulation is not far away, and the rapture is going to be very soon. Amen. If we're that much closer to the tribulation, then that means these times we're living in will be very similar and just as hard, even though not as hard, but at the borderline hard as the tribulation. As we face these times, you wonder why you're struggling with your walk with Jesus Christ, why it's hard to endure to the end, so to speak, in serving God the best way that you can with all the temptation, with all the wickedness and everything that's going on in your life. What will carry you through no matter how great the temptation is, listen, no matter how great the temptation is, no matter how great the attack is, no matter how great the stress is, and the devil can pour all of hell on earth upon you, but I promise you this, you will stand, Amen. you will survive by one aspect. And this aspect that you desperately need has endured for the past 2,000 years of church history. It is what got the martyrs through when they were torn apart by lions. It is what got the reformers and Bible believers and Anabaptists through as they were tortured by the Inquisition and they were burned alive at the stake. Incredible things that you've heard about, incredible life-changing testimonies of these Christians 2,000 years without the aid of technology, science, and government benefits, but they endured, they conquered, whereas every other kingdom civilization has died out, except this Christian movement for 2,000 years. And what carried them through was faith. Yeah. Amen. What is faith? A strong conviction. Wow. So the devil can tempt you all he wants to, but if you're so stubborn and you keep saying, I won't do it, and your conviction is that strong, he can throw a candy in front of you as long as he wants to, but you're not going to budge. So a conviction that is so strong is what's going to pull you through. And that's what Isaiah talked about with the nation of Israel. That's what's going to pull them through. In Isaiah chapter 50, verse 1, Thus saith the Lord, Where is the bill of your mother's divorcement, whom I have put away? Or which of my creditors is it to whom I have sold you? Behold, for your iniquities have ye you sold yourselves, and for your transgressions is your mother put away. Wherefore, when I came, was there no man? When I called, was there none to answer? Is my hand shortened at all, <coughs> that it cannot redeem I have, no, if, have I no power to deliver? Behold, at my rebuke, I dry up the sea. I make the rivers a wilderness. Their fish stinketh because there is no water and dieth for thirst. Look at verse 5. The Lord God hath opened mine ear, and I was not rebellious, neither turned away back. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair, 
I hid not my face from shame and spitting, for the Lord God will help me. Therefore I shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. He is near that justifieth me. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who is mine adversary? Let him come near to me. That strength, that conviction, like flint, like a hard rock. You ever seen a hard rock? No matter how hard you try to chip it away, no matter how hard you try to break it with your bare hands, it's going to take... It's going to take a lot of effort to do so because it's strong. It's compacted. It's like a rock. And your faith can be the same no matter how much the devil chips away at it. No matter how much discouragement chips away at it. Oh, they can put a dent here and there, but it's still compacted. It's still strong. It's still intact. Wouldn't you like your life to be that way? Is your conviction hard as a rock? Let's talk about that today. Will you pray with me? Father, fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit and cleanse away my sins with your blood. I pray today's preaching will speak to your people and help them. Help them, Lord. Whatever temptation or sin they're struggling with, whatever trial that they're enduring, whatever things that they're going through in their lives, a lot of stress, pressure, and hardship, I pray that this sermon will help them tremendously in Jesus' name. I pray, amen. <coughs> my first point is... Hard sins, hard sins. The title of my message is Hard as a Rock. And to understand that, we must first understand the hardness of sin at verses 1 through 3. I read verse 1 through 2, but you'll notice right here that God tells the nation of Israel, you sold yourself because of your sins. That's the reason why you're messed up. That's why your conviction is weak and you don't have a strong faith. Verse 2, God says, whenever I called you and I gave you an opportunity, I want to give you strength in your life. I want to bless you. I want you to be a victor, a conqueror. I mean, with me, everything is possible. He said at verse 2 and verse 3, my hand is not short. Don't I clothe the heavens and did I create all the universe? You got a great God and I'm on your side. You can overcome anything. Will you? Join me at my side, and the verse says, none answered. And the reason why is because of their sin. God never said, listen, God never said in that verse, I allowed temptation and sin to happen in your life in a way where you would be separated and distanced from my help. He never said that there. The tendency of our Christian life is to think that way. It's to think that God allows, I didn't say Calvinistically, he makes these things happen. But we think that God lets these trials happen to test our faith. And because we fail the test, that's the reason why we don't have the conviction to go through and we mess up. Now, there is truth in that statement, don't get me wrong, but I think that we have a wrong idea. We don't have a full understanding of this. <laughs> the verse pointed out, it's your sins that caused you to separate, not God. So God had nothing to do with it <coughs> because the opposite is true. He don't let trials happen to you so you can fall. He answers he calls you out so that you can get out of that trial so that you can get out of that sin you have to realize that we live in a world filled with sin so any bad thing can happen any trial can happen any temptation can happen that's why god has to allow these things because of the consequence of our sin do we understand that so it's not like god directly planned it out so that you can fall what he instead planned out, he directly planned out if that bad thing to, were to happen, when that bad thing is to happen, he'll provide you a way to get out of it. 
So when we go through trials and hard times, we can't think that God is testing us. God deliberately let these things happen to us so that we can fall, so as to test us and, oh, I, I failed to accomplish that feat. And then we get very discouraged, don't we? You notice right here that we're relying a lot on our own willpower, a lot our own strength, because it's as if God threw the dice on the table and then let us handle it. That's a wrong conception. God says, my way is to not let these trials happen to you so you can fail. It's more so that when these trials were to happen to you, I give you an answer. Now, my question to you is, did God answer you? Yes. Yes. Did God answer you? Amen. Some of us can say yes. Others can say no. And let's be honest about that. God's job is to give you an answer. Through that storm, through that trial, through that temptation. And what did he answer you? If he gives you an answer, the Bible says, faith cometh by hearing. hearing. And hearing by the word of God. So God is supposed to answer you. He's supposed to give you a word so that your faith can be built and you have a strong faith, that means. And what that means in return is if you have a strong faith, it doesn't matter what trial can happen to you, how strong the temptation is, you should be able to overcome it. So then why aren't you then? Something's wrong there in the process. There's something there where you don't have strong faith. Your faith is not strong enough. But faith should come if you hear the word of God. So is there something wrong with your hearing? Did God give you an answer? What did God answer you to get you out of that addiction problem that you're struggling with in your home? You need to get out and go to church. So he gave you an answer. All right, then why do you keep failing? Why do you keep going back to that same addiction? You know going to church is good for you because it gets you out of trouble, one. Number two, you're not used to being alone in your flesh and with your mind running with vain imaginations and you wonder why temptation is so big. So then why is it you can't get to church and you can't get away from sin? Well, you can't get victory over your addiction. See, God gave you an answer. Go to church. But what prevented you from following the answer? Didn't verse 1 and 2 and 3 said, when I called, no one answered? And what's the reason? Verse 1, sin. Sin. So God gave you an answer. Go to church. But see, listen, it's not that I'm too weak. That's our problem. We always think like that. I'm too weak. I'm just too wicked. We already know that. God already knows that. But he ain't going to give you an answer that you can't, that you aren't able to do. His answer should be the answer. Answer means solution. Fix the problem. But what's preventing you from following the solution and getting the answer is the verse that's sin. So it's not just, I'm too weak, I'm too sinful, or it's hard to go to church. I neglected to go to church. That's the reason why I fell back to my addiction. There's a deeper reason, but there's a more simple answer. Your sin. So what's your sin? You don't think about that. You think that your sin is, well, it's because I failed to go to church? No, 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 no. There's a sin that made you fail to go to church. There's a sin that makes it hard for you. There's a sin that makes you feel so weak and pathetic. So what is it? Then maybe you'll find out it's laziness. I just don't want to go push myself. And if you surrender that to the Lord and say, I'm going to push myself, I'm willing to go through hardness, then you will go to church. Yeah. And you'll get over your addiction. Yeah. And listen, 
when you find that core sin issue, which is, I'm not willing to push myself, you'll find out that is the very reason why you're stuck in addiction then. You'd be surprised if you were to find out what your specific sin problem is that you did not surrender to the Lord, that you hardly thought about. If you surrendered it to the Lord, it might solve 10 different problems you're probably going through right now. God gave you an answer. But, what, but why aren't you following the answer? Your sin. You need to find out what that is. Oh, it's not just failing to go to church. It's not just an addiction with smoking and drinking alcohol and something sexual. No, no, no. That ain't the sin. The sin is, I just want to feel good. And I don't like to be pushed. The sin is, what is the sin? You have to find that out. Could it be that I just want to stay discouraged and think negative thoughts? Is it, I love this bitter feeling? And I don't want to feel joyous? What is it? It might be guilt. It might be guilt. And that's the reason why you give up going to church. Because you feel guilty. And that's the reason why you keep falling into addiction. Why? You feel guilty. I, I mess up anyway. Might as well. See, guilt is the sin. So you have to find out what is your sin. That's preventing you from following God's answer. And you'd be surprised that sin you get right with God might solve a lot of problems that you're going through. And then what happens? Your faith is strengthened. You got a strong conviction. And you will go to church and you will not fall into that addiction because you already built up your faith. You already surrendered to the Lord that I need to make my flesh uncomfortable. I have to realize that as soon as I wake up in the morning, it will feel uncomfortable and I just have to do it. That's how you're going to get strong conviction, is you find out that sin problem you have. The second one is hard submission. Hard submission, verse 4 through 5. The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season. To him that is weary, he wakeneth morning by morning. He wakeneth mine ear to hear as to learn. The Lord God hath opened mine ear, and I was not rebellious, neither turned away back. Look at this. Isaiah identified himself with the nation of Israel and mentioned that God was able to open his tongue to speak. He's able to speak the right words at the right timing and that God was the one who opened his ears to hear what God wants him to hear and that God was the one who changed the rebellion in his heart and he was not able to turn back. I want that in my life and I'm sure you want that in your life. That's why one of the biggest things that excites me about going to heaven is that God's going to just transform this wretched, wicked, sinful flesh where I can do whatever I want and it won't be sin. Where I will never let my God down again. Where everything I say, think, and do, and feel is holy. Man, what a thing. I want that. But only God can do that. You and I know that. Our willpower can't do that. God has to do that, which is why he's going to transform your body at the rapture. Wow. Now, you and I, when we hear about that, that's why we have a defeatist attitude, thinking that I'll never attain something like that, which is true. God's not going to change your desires right now and make you want to read the Bible, make you want to pray, make you want to think spiritual thoughts. That's not how it works. Because we're locked up in the prison of our flesh. And we always mess up. You know, I'm kind of getting sick and tired of preachers when they would tell somebody when the person's struggling with something and they're going through a really hard time and they genuinely don't want to sin. They genuinely want to live right for God. And it's not like they're really lazy or that they're really... A nobody, a low-down person, but they went through genuine hurt, a hard time, they don't live in a good area, and they got temptation running around them 24-7, unlike that preacher there. 
And because of that, the preacher just simply pounding on the person, just read your Bible, pray, what's the matter with you? You just need to be strong in the Lord. You're just too weak. I hate that kind of answer because once the Lord humbles me, puts them in their shoes, in their similar scenarios, then I realize it ain't that easy. It ain't that easy. It's hard because my flesh is built its machine to sin. Do you understand that? So how can I get a strong conviction to get over these sins? To get over my weaknesses and serve God? I can't because I'm built in. Ah, but Am I not just describing the flesh? Does the Holy Spirit lust after sin? Does the Holy Spirit want to think wicked thoughts? Does the Holy Spirit want to skip Bible reading and prayer? Does the Holy Spirit get bitter and discouraged and upset at God? No. The Holy Spirit, listen, is built in. It's built in, the Holy Spirit to read the Bible and pray. The Holy Spirit is built in to sing the hymn. The Holy Spirit is built in, is built in to hate that sin and temptation and want it gone from out of its life. The Holy Spirit is built in to rejoice in the Lord no matter how great your pain is in the flesh. It's built in, do you understand that? And that verse says, the Lord opened my ears. The Lord caused me to speak at the right time. The Lord was the one who changed my rebellious heart. You know what all that's done? Spiritually. And spiritually speaking, the Holy Spirit is built in to not be rebellious, to listen to God and obey Him. You know that? I have a question. Do you have the Holy Spirit inside you? Isn't your soul a part of that Holy Spirit? <laughs> then there's something in you that doesn't want to sin. It's built in you. There's something in you that's built in and pleading with you. Let's get on the altar again and get right with God. There's something built in you where you're discouraged and bitter but something's built in you to resist that, isn't it? Yep. <laughs> Glory to God! Do you understand what I'm talking about right here? You got something in you, and that's the Holy Spirit. It doesn't want to sin. It wants to live right, and it wants to endure the suffering and the pain, no matter how great it is. You got it. So why not give in? Why not give in to that? I know that I know, stop pretending like you're, oh, my flesh is just too strong and I'm just too weak and I can't do something. No, 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 no. You know there's something in you that says, I want to go to church. Yes. There's something in you that says, let's stop being bitter at God. There's something in you that says, I'm hungry to read that book. Just get a word from heaven. Yes. There's something in you that says, I want to talk to God. I just got so much. So just give in to it. Amen. There's something built in you. It yearns for righteousness, holiness, peace. And no matter how many times you fail and mess up again, for some weird reason, some magnetic power is bringing you back here again. Making you sit down and listen to this preaching again. Making you have hope again. No matter how many times you drop, no matter how bad your life is, there's something in you that's so stubborn and built in that will keep coming back here and have the hope that I'm going to hear something that might help me. Yes. You know why? You got something stubborn and built in you that's hard as a rock. And that's the Holy Spirit. He's so compacted. He's so strong that no matter how many times the flesh or the devil will chip at it, it's still intact. And it will bug you till the day you die. And it will bug you when you mess up and sin again. 
It will bug you every time you get it in bitterness and discouragement. You know why? There's something built in you to resist. There's something built in you to fight. There's something built in you to cling on to that hope. Just give up. That's a hard submission, see? That's a hard submission. So if that musician is playing and the song leader is song leading and your heart's like, just say amen. The heart's like, just, 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 just smile. Just, and then you see that stubborn built-in flesh saying, oh, no, no, you, you, you're a hypocrite for singing that. Oh, no, 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 you know that after this you're going to mess up again. Oh, no, 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 life is so unfair. No, no, Jesus is not that good to you. He is not altogether lovely as that hymn goes. Hey, when that flesh says that, you know the Spirit is saying, isn't Jesus good? Isn't Jesus lovely? Man, we're going to go to the pearly white city one day. There's nothing defiling or mean. Just give in to it and say glory to God. Amen. My third point is hard strength. Hard strength. I hope this will help you. You know what's going to pull you through no matter how bad your day is, no matter how strong the sin is, and no matter how weak you are? It's this strong conviction. If you're so stubborn and built in, the devil can tempt you all you want. You're going to stay true to the Lord. I think it works better than the greatest science, for science keeps changing after 2,000 years, but faith endured for 2,000 years. My third point is hard strength. Look at verse 6 through 9. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. For the Lord God will help me. Therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint. And I know that I shall not be ashamed. He is near that justifieth me. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near to me. As Isaiah was prophesying about Israel restoring itself, having a strong conviction to stand against the enemy, Isaiah was also prophesying from this passage the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ said, who's my enemy, my adversary? Let him come. And when he endured that cross, he wasn't like, oh, this is so hard. Oh, I'm, gonna, I'm so pathetic and weak. No, Jesus Christ said, bring it on. That nail ain't hard enough. Hammer it in. And the devil's like, just go ahead. You know, you can't bear the sins of all of mankind. And Jesus Christ said, who is my adversary? Who is my enemy? Let him come to me. He was the only, he's the only being who can ever challenge the devil. Me and you are not like that. You and me are so weak, we'd fall apart. The devil will chew us up for breakfast and spit us out. But you know what? We can learn from Jesus Christ at least, at the very least, we need to have some grit and strength. We, know, we need to have this rebellion and this resistance against the enemy. You know why you keep messing up and you know why your faith is not that strong? Simple. You are not built in. You are not determined. You never uh, had it in your mind that I'm going to fight hard today. No, all you do when you wake up in the morning is uh, what will please me? What will make me feel comfortable? What am I going to do? No, you got to think about, you've got to think about, I'm going to fight hard today. See, you need to have that. You know what the devil's most successful tactic that you've heard the preacher talk about, that we're under a new attack from the devil, which is why it's so hard for Christians to serve God, and they're much weaker compared to persecuted Christians before us, is because a new tactic the devil employed was comfort, was to please the flesh. It's a Laodicean spirit. And that's the reason why Richard Warmbrandt who was tortured for Jesus Christ by communists, he even said that this Laodicean prosperity is harder than persecution. Would you believe that? You know why? Because we're so programmed and so used to in the morning, what can make me feel better? 
What can make me happy? What can make me feel comfortable? Instead of thinking about, hey, they're going to make, try to make me deny Jesus Christ. And I need to fight it out. Oh, God, help me again. Oh, God, I'm praying to you desperately. Well, no, we don't think of that like that. We're like, where's my first cup of coffee? And I just want to get work over with and crash and do something that will please my flesh. You got fight in you? When you enter this church, yes, it's a good time. Yes, there's nothing better like it. And God really blesses you. And man, it's just going to get marvelous and wonderful. But don't think that you came to this church without putting up a fight. You know what you entered into? You entered, you enlisted in the military. And that's the reason why some people can't handle it and they have to go to mega churches. Do you understand that? This is too hot. The pew is too hot to sit on. Why? Because it's war. And nobody wants to war. And that's why the devil gets to you every time and you don't have a strong conviction. You know why you don't have a strong conviction? Because you're so used to being comfortable. So conviction never even entered into your mind. You know what it is? Instead of this independent conviction, it's more of a dependability on something to make you feel good. And you wonder why America and everywhere around the world is becoming communist. You ever wondered about that? Because people are so used to being dependable on something to make them feel comfortable, to sustain them, and they lack conviction. Independent, critical thinking, questioning themselves, well, what am I doing? What am I doing wrong? What's wrong with the system? They, they don't think, because they're just lost in, I just want to do what I want to do and let this thing keep sustaining me. This government, this higher education, this job, this pay, this Bay Area. No wonder those spirits gotten a hold of you then. My question to you is, do you have an enemy? Do you have an enemy? If you have an enemy, can you name him to me right now, your enemy? I have another question. Do you have lots of enemies? Do you know what their names are? You know what an enemy is? I'll tell you what an enemy is, like in God's word, about enemies to him. There's hatred there. You ever seen someone, sometimes I don't understand, someone in church that can be so bitter at somebody in the church, and they're supposed to be on the same side, and they're Bible believers, but then that person thinking, man, that person's my enemy. That person did me wrong. I'm going to get even with that person. And what they will do is that they don't care how tired they are or how uncomfortable it is for them. If they're going to come out on top, they'll do whatever it takes to stay stubborn in their stubborn feeling, their stubborn conviction to make sure they come out on top and that other person fall. That's what bitterness does. I'm right no matter what and they will put up a fight to make sure that they will come out on top. They're not going to rest and relinquish and go, oh, okay, you win. And No, 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 no. Bitter people are too stubborn. They'll go through sleepless nights. They'll work extra hard just so that they can come out on top. Now I have a question. If Christians can do that with fellow Christians, that's a warped mentality when we should be doing that to the world, the flesh, and the devil. And you wonder why Bible believers are falling apart? We're bitter at the wrong people. We make enemies out of the wrong people. And if you targeted discouragement, guilt, flesh, sin, and whatever the devil threw at you, and you said, you're my enemy. And you said, I'm bitter. Yeah, yeah, I believe in bitterness. You should be bitter at that enemy. You should be so angry. Paul even said, taking vengeance against your flesh and sin, that you recompense it with good. Yeah. And you're like, I want to get even with you, flesh. I want to get even with you, world. I want to, I'm going to show you a thing or two. Amen. You know why I do? Every time I go through a trial or suffering, I turn that into a sermon. Amen. Yeah, I showed him. Yeah. I like to do that. Preach. Do you have that grit, that fight in you? You know what that verse says? Jesus welcome the attack. J Jesus dared the attack. That's how he's able to win. You know how people win? 
not by running away, not by resisting. They're ready to head on. That's welcoming. That's accepting the attack. I'm not telling you to be stupid and challenge the devil and say, bring it on. I'm not telling you to do that. But when the devil throws something at you, you've got to accept it. You've got to welcome it. Why? Because you'll never run away from it. You can pretend it doesn't exist by drowning out yourself with sin, but guess what? It's still there. And you're in la-la land. So you know what you got to do? You got to welcome it. But you know what makes it a powerful attack and a fight? One of the best martial arts is jujitsu. Why? The enemy and then you don't run away. You don't dodge and then, you know, stuff like that. You, what you do is you take it, you welcome it, and hit it back right on them. So when suffering happens, you know what I'm going to do? Sunday service. Bam! I think it's not bad so far. I think it's working so far. You know what happens when, let me give you the worst case. Let's say sin comes in. And you mess up. And it is your fault. You mess up. You yielded to temptation and sin. What are you going to do? Oh, it's awful. Oh, you know, I'm defeated. And oh, I'll never get victory. No, no, welcome it. Yes. Welcome that attack when sin comes in. You know what you do after that? Let's use my testimony to help some brother and sister who's going through the same thing. Bam! Why don't you show off that flesh, that devil, that world a bit? Do some jujitsu move. Don't just go... Uh, no, just go, bam! And maybe the devil will leave you alone. And maybe the flesh will stop. And maybe the world will just stop criticizing you because they know it's useless and it's hurting them in return. And you wonder why the devil, the world, and the flesh is so much encouraged to keep attacking you? Because you're easy target. You're easy prey. Why, bless God! You better make yourself hard for them to target. You better make them regret for hitting you. You better pay them back and do a little jujitsu and go, yeah, testimony. Yeah, prayer. Yeah, pleading the blood. Yeah, yeah. Jujitsu it. Is that in the Bible? Today it is. I told you, all right? That was inspired by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Do some motion and hit it back hard. That's hard strength. That's strength, hard strength, determination. Go ahead, let it come. I accept it. And then shout. That's what hard strength is. I'm ready to fight. My last point is hard stay. Hard stay. Look at verse 9. Behold, the Lord God will help me. Who is he that shall condemn me? Oh, they all shall wax old as a garment. The moth shall eat them up. Who is among you that feareth the Lord, that obeyeth the voice of his servant, that walketh in darkness and hath no light? Let him... Trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon his God. Behold all ye that kindle a fire, that compass yourselves about with sparks. Walk in the light of your fire, and the sparks that ye have kindled. This shall ye have a mine hand, ye shall lie down in sorrow. Look at what the prophet is preaching here. He's telling them, hey, enemies, you can go ahead and kick me and hit me. But even though I'm walking in the darkness, see that? That verse never said walking in the light. That verse said walking in the darkness. What that means is you have no light. You have no light. You have no help, no support. And all you could do, that verse says, is trust and stay in God. <laughs> and let those enemies come with their fire. You'll still come out on top. Now, where's this confidence coming from? Where's this faith coming from? I like a little something like that. 
Again, I'm not talking about challenging and daring the devil. Don't be that stupid. But there's got to be that grit in there, right? There's got to be a little bit of that resistance, right? There's got to be a little bit of fight in you, right? So then how are you going to get something like that? Because when you're walking in darkness, and let's be real. Let's not be spiritual here. Let's be real. When you and I are walking in darkness, you can say after summer camp, I'm going to go to church. I'm not going to sin again. I, my life has changed. But then you give it a couple of months and then you go back to darkness. That's real. That's real. So, so much for the Lord will be my strength and shield. So much for I can do all things through Christ which straighteneth me. So much for Bible reading, prayer, and going to church and all this kind of stuff can give you the armament that you need. So much for God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. So much for that. And you just feel in real life, I don't know what to do. You know what that is? Walking in darkness. And you have no choice but that verse says stay. Stay in God. If I were to see Jesus as my pilot, and he's driving that ship, you know, I'm in the boat. I'm staying in the boat with him. He's my pilot. He will lead me. When I take control of that wheel, brother and sister in Christ, I will fall apart. And that darkness, those dark, deep waters will crash into my ship every time. And every time I'm like, man, summer camp got to me. Man, I'm going to... I'm not going to sin. I'm going to commit myself full time to the church. And then when you do that, then you fall apart. All the time. And you just have to let go and let Jesus steer the wheel for you and guide your ship. If Jesus is the one that guides your ship through those dark waters, and that verse says that no matter what your enemies do with that darkness, that they can't win against you. And if the verse is true, that God will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. And if that verse says trust in God, that's why you can trust in God, then how come it's not happening to you? Because you don't have the right trust. What does that mean? You don't have the right faith. What does that mean? You don't have the right conviction. If you are to have the right conviction that you're confident about, I can do at least this much. And if those enemies come at me, you can go ahead, but I know at least this much I can do. And I'll stay hard like a rock and God will pull me through. Because God won't give me a burden greater than I can bear. Yes. I know that if I read just one chapter today, that's not beyond my limit. I know that no matter how great temptation is, I'll at least read one chapter. Yes. And I know that even if the storms or the enemies come at me, they can go ahead, but I'm going to still commit to one chapter. And then you stay in God. And you wonder why those people will naturally grow to reading three chapters of the Bible and a lot more chapters of the Bible. Because they had the right conviction to begin with. You wonder why in those AA meetings and people who go through rehabs and stuff like that, they don't start out with quick cold turkey. You know what they do? What can you stop for one day? Can you just not do this one day? Preach. Remember Pastor Steve Andrews, what he talked about, like he had a problem with this one, and he just thought about just today. Just today. Can't you do that much? Isn't this something you can handle? Isn't that something you can do? Think about it. I mean, I mean can't you do that? Just, just one day. Just, just don't do this. Well, tomorrow I'm going to mess up 20 years. No, 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 no. Stop thinking about that. What can you commit to? What can you convict yourself to? Just don't do this today. Can you do that? Just one day out of a whole week. Can you do that? Then, when you do that, 
then no matter what the enemy throws at you and the storms and the waters crash against you, this is something you can handle because Jesus Christ is steering the direction in your life with one day. This is the direction we're going. You see where I'm guiding you, child? Just one day. God, why can't you do all of my life? Because that's not how reality works, child. And what I'm going to guide you to, what I opened the window of opportunity for you is one day. Now, will you stay in the boat with me? Is that something you can do? Yes, Lord. All right, let's go through it. And as the wind is roaring and the thunder is crashing and the waves are getting inside the boat, you're staying in the boat, staying in the boat. And man, you feel like throwing up, don't you? You feel like, oh man, I, I just got to cave in. You feel like, oh, I can't handle it. But you know what? You said, no, 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 no. No, I can't handle this. It's just one day. I can't handle it. This is just one day. And you hold on to the ship with all your might and let trust God to steer the boat for you. You just do your part by hanging on, staying in the boat for one day. Now, those of you who can do one day, but you're still messing up here and there with other sins, those of you who can come to church or win a soul or do something in this church, Amen. maybe a couple things, that verse says, you have to walk in darkness. You know what that means? That means no light. That means no help or support. It's not easy for you. Yeah. Listen, if you can come to church every Sunday, read the Bible, pray daily, stay away from sin, I don't care. If you're not walking in darkness, your conviction ain't that strong, bud. Preach. That's right. Amen. Walk and you know what you're going to have to do? Because Jesus is steering your boat, not you. Yeah. Wow. And Jesus said, we're going to go on deeper waters now. You're supposed to become holy like me. You're supposed to grow. You ready for this? <laughs> and you know what you need to do? You need to strain yourself. You need to stay on to that boat. You got to make sure that it's dark to you. Not easy, not hopeful, and everything's good. You got to be dark to you in that life. And if that's something you can hold on to with one more thing to do in church. See, maybe that's what you need. One more thing to do in church. And if that's your thing, hold on to that boat, stay in there with all that you've got, crash through the dark wave, and let Jesus keep steering you. And you'll grow more. You see how Jesus steers the ship? How Jesus steers the ship is every dark wave is different from every individual and he's going to make sure when he's piloting your ship that it's not beyond your limit that you throw up and die and you get seasick. Or that the wave easily catches onto you and you fall off the boat. It's something you can handle. Because God promised he's faithful. You just have to stay in there. What if you get off the boat? You can't even do one, huh? And you mess up. And you fall off the boat. Should you be discouraged? Is your conviction weak? Isn't, didn't the verse say, trust in God? Didn't the verse say, God is the one who will be my fortress and he's the one controlling everything, not you? Then I'd like to ask you this question. When you fell off the boat, wasn't God still in control over your life and offered you his hand and say, hey, get back in the boat. I'll pull you in. Yeah. Then why are you turning down that hand? And if you grab his hand and he pulls you in the boat, guess what that means? You're not out of the boat. That means you're still staying in there. The wave can crash all it wants to and, you, and throw you off the boat all it wants. But every time Jesus extends that hand to you, Hey, you got another Sunday in church. It's not over yet. Hey, you got that book in your, the Bible in your bookshelf. It's not over yet. Hey, didn't I promise you I'm faithful and just to forgive you your sins? Amen. Hey, and every time he gives you that hand and you just grab it, 
you're still staying in the boat with him. You're not out. So you know what that verse says? Stay on God. Trust in him. For he is truly the one who's directing every instant in your life as you take one step with him. So you just let him worry about that. Let him control the ship. You just do your part every time he extends that hand out to you and just stay in the boat. Do you see a hand open? I... I want to grab that hand. I don't know about you. I don't want to be in those dark waters. Boy, I'm choking and I'm drowning. It's horrible. But you know what? Even though I gave up on myself, God never gave up on me. And he still gave me that hand. All I have to do is trust so I can stay in the boat. So my conviction is still stubborn, that means. I never got out of my Christian walk, that means. I'm hard to get off, no matter how much the devil tries to get me off the ship, because I always come back. See, my conviction then is strong. Do you see that hand? Will you come?